Welcome to the Boardwalk Talks program brought to you by the Alabama Aquarium at the Dauphin Island Sea Lab. My name is Mendel Graber. I am one of the educators here at the lab and I am delighted to introduce you to a good friend of mine, Chris Nichols, who has worked for NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, on their research ships for over a decade. And um, before that, he had a storied career as a mariner that led him to the NOAA research fleet. And uh, so I'm going to let Chris tell you a little bit about the life on board a NOAA ship, uh, ships in general, life at sea, um, some of the shipboard operations, the scientific research operations of the NOAA fleet and uh, some of his cool experiences at sea. And maybe, uh, uh, you know, some information about how uh, you could uh, get involved in a mariner's life. So with that, I will let well, Chris tell you a little bit. Well, thank you, Mendel. Um, uh, thank you for having me, Dauphin Island Sea Lab, uh, faculty, staff, and uh, students. Um, wow, what, a, what an opportunity this is to talk about such an interesting past and, and future that I have here um, on the Gulf Coast and especially aboard the NOAA ship Oregon 2. Um, my current position is I am the chief boatswain and that's many people say it different ways they'll say boatswain or boatswain or stuff like that but but it's the boats, boatswain and it's an old, old nautical um, term for the leader of the deck department. Um, and that's what I've been doing for the last couple of years, and I've kind of worked my way up through the, through the um, process of being a merchant marine over all these years. Um, I got to the NOAA ship Oregon II, home ported in Pascagoula, Mississippi, in November of 2011. And at that point, I'd been working with uh, NOAA for a few years. And I had found myself on a ship out of Honolulu, Hawaii. And my first mission was to up towards Midway Atoll. And um, on that trip, I was um, able to um, help uh, bring back artifacts from a, uh, a Nantucket whale ship that, was, um, that had been found a couple of years before. And uh, that was just incredible. After all the sailing I had done prior to that through the commercial fishing and uh, the United States Navy and the working with the Department of Defense after the Navy and then finding myself at NOAA and then getting to do something really, really important and very, very interesting. And just, um, just to be around all these different types of people that I had never, never, uh, just couldn't believe the amount of smart people I was around um, and it was an honor to make friends with with these folks and um, go to some of the most remote locations in the world um, places uh, only a, a fraction of a handful of people will ever get to go and experience so that was a great first assignment and my second assignment um, found me in Tahiti um, was working on down on the uh, down on the uh, um, um, tsunami buoy array, which they have across the Pacific. And that was just a really, really cool place. And as a merchant marine, you, you don't find yourself uh, often going to beautiful, wonderful, um, interesting places like that. Typically, a merchant marine will find you uh, loading and unloading um, supplies or fuel or other things in industrial ports but with with NOAA uh, they always pull in or usually pull into very very nice places that are um, you know you walk right out the gate and you're right in the middle of town so yeah that's always been a really really nice part about being a mariner um, you never know what you're going to get really um, so do you want to tell us a little bit about kind of like your pathway to the... Uh, well, my, my path to... Going farther back than... Oh boy. <laughs> um, <laughs> when, when I was a little guy, when I was very young, I always heard um, my family's stories. They would say, um, Chris, you're, 
your great grandfather, he was a survivor of the battleship Maine, or um, your your uh, uh, great uncle um, was a merchant marine and he uh, brought home a monkey one time, and then the. Uh, my, my other grandfather had been in the army in World War II and been all throughout Europe and it just seemed like something like this was going to to be what I had to do and I have a great quote from a very dear friend of mine and shipmate um, and that was I knew at a very young age that I was not going to have an ordinary job and and that is what <clears throat> what is what has traveled me to all these interesting places and learned so many things. Um, when, when you're thinking about this, um, I was not a good student in school at all. And I, my mind was, was off in other places. I, of course, I made my way through school and I, um, I got moved back to Florida and uh, started commercial fishing and working in the sport fishing industry and and uh, in order to work your way up to being a fishing boat captain you had to know navigation and I had done this fishing for so long and I just didn't know how to do anything other than fishing so I said well I gotta join the Navy so I joined the Navy and I ended up on an aircraft carrier and went through several different um, conflicts during the 90s and uh, and uh, was able to go to um, all throughout the Mediterranean and down into the Indian Ocean and uh, was part of so many interesting um, um, activities that were, were going on back then. And uh, finally I decided that it was time to get out of the Navy and then I went back into the civilian Navy which was the Merchant Marine and uh, found that I could do the same thing and or more Navy stuff as a as a merchant marine working for the Department of the Navy, delivering ammunition, fuel, supplies, and, uh, and um, maintaining their ships and, and their locations at sea around the world. And that was great, great time. I, well, I've been, I did more Navy stuff with those guys, certainly, than I ever did while I was in the actual Navy. So I worked for Military Sea Lift Command for, I don't know, about seven years. And then I left that and I took a break after spending two years in, in working in the Pacific and not coming home. And I decided that it was time to come home and, um, and take a break. So I came back and uh, worked in um, property management for a while and, and I started to miss that sunrise and sunset on the bridge and having a cup of coffee thing. And it was, it was if you haven't done that before, you. That's just, there's nothing, nothing like So let's clarify that when you say on the bridge, you mean on the ship. <laughs> the bridge on the ship. The bridge <laughs> on the ship, yes. The pilot house. Um, yeah, there's um, a calling and people, people really get that. And, and by that time, I had realized that, that um, there's a great line in a Jimmy Buffett song called um, One Particular Harbor. And it says, uh, I'll rule my world through the payphone or something like that. And I had been doing that very well for <laughs> for quite some time and it looked like I was going to do that and and in order to be a merchant marine you really need to have what is known as a sense of adventure and um, the ability to kind of fit in about anywhere and um, and kind of just take take it as it as take life as it comes to you and and really really enjoy what you do um, in the merchant marine you have several different paths you can go you can go the licensed route, which would put you working as a, a licensed merchant marine officer, which they typically are the, um, the bridge personnel. And of course they, they um, have uh, merchant marine academies for that. And there's also uh, training, training schools, uh, merchant marine um, uh, voc uh, vocational schools and stuff like that. And then you have the um, route that I took. And I took the, the um, able-bodied seaman um, route and um, I started I, luckily because of my Navy time I was able to put that towards my my merchant marine document and I was able to become a able seaman limited 
which is the the middle middle way, and that that didn't really make any difference in 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 pay or anything like that, but certainly got you to the unlimited, which is a, a desirable spot where a senior um, mariner would would find themselves. Um, at that point. Um, um, the uh, the um, the training uh, there's so many different uh, departments that you can find yourself in. So you can find yourself in the marine engineering, which they run the engine room, and they take care of the uh, engineering plant on the ship, and they they have various uh, types of um, um, propulsion. You know, you can have uh, steam, um, you can have diesel, electric, and nuclear, and there's all kinds of ways to go, and you're. Your uh, background uh, with that will definitely set you um, on your direction where you would go with the merchant marines. Um, on the Oregon too, we have very small. Our ship's uh, about 183 feet long, so it's got a very small engine room. But I've been on ships that have had four engine rooms, four propellers, and three rudders. I, I, it, it just uh, the options of Marine engineering is, is very good, and the, uh, the pay for that is very good as well. Uh, those guys, all of those guys really have earned their, uh, earned their, uh, earned their way for sure. And that's a, not a bad route to go. Um, there's the culinary department, um, would be considered the supply department, and you gotta have good um, chow on a ship, and we always have really great chow. There's a um, uh, saying that, um, I like to say um, that that we are well supplied and well rested and uh, well trained and that's one thing for sure at NOAA there's plenty of that and um, the chow on board is is always very good um, sometimes uh, they uh, the the chief stewards will will always ask the crew what what they like and they'll try to to lean towards that <clears throat> then there's the uh, electronics um, technicians that we have and they're the ones that ensure that the uh, communications are all up and that the uh, computer systems communications and scientific equipment are all in order and able working properly and and if they break they can fix them we carry plenty of extra parts on the ships so that if something goes down we don't have to pull in and a lot of this stuff we have to merchant marine uh, has to be able to repair themselves at sea best as possible <clears throat> and if not try and find a way to continue the mission and have some compromise but um, just uh, in order to uh, pulling in and pulling out is uh, is costly and time and and things like that so um, having the best um, technicians and operators and <clears throat> engineers and Seamen are, uh, uh, it's, it's the key to uh, the fleet. The Oregon too has been very good to me. And um, uh, we, um, our mission so, on the Oregon. So oh, let's okay. go back for just a second because you started telling us about how you, you know, your start in NOAA. Before oh. you came to the Oregon too, when, like, how did you um, kind of take that path? As, as a merchant marine into the NOAA fleet? Um, well, my background, um, it was all based on what I had done in the past. And um, being that before I was in the Navy, I was a commercial fisherman, sport fisherman, so I had learned how to um, handle fish and how to catch fish, and that was kind of the beginnings of all that. Uh, I spent time working on um, charter boats and we would oftentimes catch fish and you would have to hold them and, and understand their, um, where the sharp points and the bite points and all the pokes and all the different stuff and essentially understand the movement characteristics of, of fish. And um, that was one of the things that kind of was a um, important part of my progress at NOAA was having this background in fishing. What attracted you to NOAA? I can, I can see why you would be an attractive uh, um, um, well, part I, of their crew, but what I, attracted you to NOAA? I remember when I was in the Navy and NOAA used to have, well they have their ships located in Norfolk and I would see them go by and their, their base is up, up, the, up the river from us and I would see those ships go by 
and uh, always kind of look at them and wonder, well, I wonder what those guys are doing. I'm over here with all this. I wonder what that would be about. So I've had an awareness of them, whether I thought I could get there or not back then, I didn't know. And it all just kind of happened. And, and I, <laughs> I like to look at my career as um, kind of stumbling up into things, um, being able to recognize opportunity and, and being humble and thankful to any opportunities that have been given because I've been given so many opportunities um, from my, my peers and, and supervisors and captains and, and anyone I've ever worked, worked with, I've always tried to be, be more available and, and helpful and I, I don't know, I, I, I always seemed like I always took the, I wanted to take the hardest or most dirty job and become the best at doing that. You know, I think there's some value in, in, in doing that. That way, once you have achieved this um, sense of ownership over, over a particular task and, and get good at it, then you know, maybe others will recognize that you've got, you've got um, something special about you. And I'm just so thankful to have been recognized as, as, as one, of those, one of those people. And, so and I can't, can't explain it, it's just kind of stumbling up. So you spent a couple of years with NOAA on other ships, and then you found yourself on the Oregon II, which is uh, home ported in Pascagoula, and you've been on the Oregon II for over 10 years. Right. Can you tell us about your role on the Oregon II? Um, some of the things that y'all have done? When I, when I got to the Oregon II, it was, I, was, um, I was so, so, um, um, I couldn't believe it. Um, get to do what, 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 you know, and I mean, who, who, who wouldn't want to have their official federal job title as lead fisherman or fisherman? So here's the Oregon um, too. This is the Oregon too. Yep, she's a beauty. Um, the, um, the having your job title being a lead fisherman or something like that is, is pretty, pretty cool. And to be around around so many scientists and, and uh, that, that really really under, have an understanding. But a lot of times I found that they, the scientists knew a lot about these things, but what, what I knew and brought to them was, was very helpful to the, to the science party, being that, that um, having a background where, where you could have an understanding of, of big animals and uh, and uh, nets and uh, fishing lines and hooks and, and all that and being able to put that together and, and, and gain their, um, their uh, trust that you were, were, were um, had good uh, seamanship and, um, and um, um, good. brought a lot of good value to their team. So could you tell us about, say, a typical year? For the Oregon too. Okay, um, <clears throat> our year um, ends around Thanksgiving and the end of uh, the end of uh, um, November. Well, the the, um, the field season. The field season um, will end in November, and then that's where we kind of take a break, and then for for a month or so, everyone's kind of it's kind of slows down, but work's still getting done. But and uh, port, but you're port. in port for um, pretty much from November until the end of April ish, and that's kind of the the routine for most scientific ships, um, as they will um, have that sort of set up. Some ships, because of their surveys, will leave sooner, maybe in January, or if they're working remote, they'll they'll do their downtime in a foreign port. Um, some of our ships will do that. Um, they'll find themselves in. Uh, uh, South Africa or in the Barbados and stuff over the holidays. So it's an interesting place to have your, your downtime. But um, um, ours is uh, that, that you get through the holidays and then we start to really get going and our training starts. And everybody will start going to training schools and all the maintenance on the ship and bringing everything together and preparing for April. And April kicks off the surveys and our first survey is plankton. And the plankton survey, uh, we um, will go out into the, the uh, Gulf of Mexico. And we do the entire Gulf of Mexico, and uh, we're targeting um, the data for the uh, 
bluefin tuna and uh, a stock of set or a um, health and uh, um, abundance of that that uh, larval. So you're finding um, larval bluefin tuna. Oh yeah. And so yeah. just for those who don't know, um, these are plankton nets. Uh, the mesh is very small on those nets and a lot of fish, even fish that grow to be very large, um, begin life as plankton and plankton are organisms that drift with currents. So it's not like a taxonomic group, it's a lifestyle. So right. um, even a lot of fish that we're more familiar with them when they're adults and they're very large, they may begin life as plankton. Right, and we work with um, the CMAP organization, which is a, a, a mixture of state, federal, and uh, um, uh, colleges, universities, and we share information back and forth, and we'll work together um, on achieving all these um, different locations. So our plankton survey will do the entire uh, Gulf of Mexico, and we do uh, a grid where it takes two weeks to do one side and two weeks to do the other side. Um, and uh, every about every three hours, so it's kind of like a kind of like a, a ratcheting. Um, um, but every three hours, we'll stop and do another station. So you'd have a different science party that goes with you on these different surveys, right? Yes. So you have the um, the crew of the ship who are on the ship year round, or or even when they're in the port, they're assigned to the ship. But right. then you have different science parties that will join you on the ship for these different uh, research surveys. Right. The, the scientific party is made up of uh, resident scientists who reside out of the Pascagoula laboratory and um, volunteers. So you will get volunteers from universities or just interested people or <clears throat> um, sometimes we'll have uh, folks from the um, um, from the federal government will come down to so that they can experience what we're what we're doing so they so then when we're giving them our data they can understand where it's all coming from but uh, we'll we'll have um, typically uh, our ships company is about 20 2019 or 20 folks and then um, our scientific party will carry us up to about 31 people and we'll run two shifts 12-hour shifts, so we're running all day, all night. So 24-hour, 24-hour uh, um, um, survey. But plankton is uh, uh, very important, and we get um, a lot of information from that. We get, of course, we get our abundance and um, water quality and health of the Gulf comes from that through our CTDs, uh, conductivity, uh, temperature, and depth, yeah. and uh, that's. Uh, uh, where we we can't do a station without having one of one of those conducted a CTD at every station um, because we need to know what the health and what the um, condition is and we get a lot of information from that a lot of the environmental information the wind speed and the current directions current speed is all recorded as well so how long is the plankton survey so how long is that um, we're we're uh, uh, one month, uh, about a month, month and a half will will be um, spent on that on that survey, and then we'll typically come in for um, seven days or something like that um, on the high end. Sometimes it's a quicker turnaround, and we will do uh, four days. It depends on what the schedule looks like and the uh, endurance of the crew. The ship's endurance, they say, is thirty days, but typically we're only out for two weeks. So when you come in, you're doing things like resupplying right. food and, and fuel, and then you're offloading the scientific equipment that, and the science party and yeah. swapping. So that's what you do in between the, the different surveys. And then you have a different science party that would come aboard. Right, yep. And um, we have um, typically tried to plan, um, luckily on the Oregon, we do the same surveys uh, annually, and all of our surveys are mandated surveys so we have to do them so we're kind of already sort of prepared we have things pre-staged so that when we do pull in from one survey we can offload them quickly that all that all that gear goes into a truck or gets moved into a warehouse and then the other gear is staged on the pier and we can get it on pretty quick and have some downtime and guys uh, the crew will take take some leave and go and um, um, R&R um, travel a little bit and get ready to go again 
So when you say mandated, so this is a federal operation. I just right. I, I know that we we explained what the acronym NOAA is, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, but a lot of people are not very familiar with NOAA. So this is a federal um, this is a it falls under the Department of Commerce. Department of Commerce, yes. And uh, so when Chris says it's mandated, you know, this is a federal operation and they have their directive from the right. federal government. Um, being that we're with the Department of Commerce, uh, they're, they're trying to keep an eye on the seafood industry and the health of our, our waters. And we, we cover all kinds of stuff. At NOAA, generally, they do uh, mapping of the bottom and um, they do uh, oceanography where they'll go out and, and uh, work um, all throughout our waters and internationally with our, our uh, other, other nations and our other territories that, that we, um, we work with and, and that are our partners. Um, the, um, the blue economy is what we're all about. And if, if it's got anything to do with uh, fisheries or historical um, stuff or um, mapping of the bottom, which is very, very, very important. Um, that's, what, that's what we do. So what comes next after the plankton? Um, well, then we move into uh, our um, ground fish survey. And ground fish survey is, um, we always call it fishing, but it's actually sampling. Um, we use old fishing, the same tactics that we've, that, that we've been using to do the ground fish survey ever since I, I, it goes way back decades. Um, so we're, we're, we'll do a, a trawl, a shrimp trawl, and we run that for 30 minutes, and then we bring it up. Uh, we, being the, that we're a shorter time, we don't have to have the, uh, the turtle excluder devices on our nets, and we can do our, our sample um, with that 30 minutes and then get the sample up and then it gets, gets put onto the conveyor belt and every shrimp, every, every croaker, every cobia, every starfish, uh, and every chunk of wood, um, seaweed, anything that comes up is weighed, processed, sexed, and uh, recorded and uh, and um, it's just an incredible process. It takes a long time to do it, or it can take a short time, depending on stuff. And always remember that if you don't catch anything, that's still data. So no, no, no data is still data. Interesting thought. So how long are you out for the ground fish survey? Uh, that would be, we have three legs of that, and they're two week legs. I'd say probably close to two months all in all together uh, is so, focused on that. Yes. And that's a summer and yeah. then there's a fall survey for that where we do the same stuff and go to the same areas and we're essentially doing the same stuff but, but t for two chunks of the year. Uh, and we'll cover from Brownsville, Texas to Key West and we'll typically start off of Brownsville and work our way to Galveston, Texas, stop in there for a few days, get some um, new scientists and um, new supplies and change out gear, send the samples back, get new, sam uh, new, new gear for that. Um, um, yeah, I'm trying to like And then we'll work our way back to Pascagoula and then we'll have uh -huh. one more leg that reaches over into uh, Florida waters out on the uh, West Florida shelf. Yeah, just trying to kind of paint a picture of the year. So we yes. start uh, you know, at the beginning with in-port maintenance of the ship, then in April is the plankton survey, and then the summer do the, like, like April to May, and then summertime, the ground fish survey, and right. then what comes after that? Kind and of, then, you know, kind of in the year. Then, uh, it, it just flows, and um, it's high tempo. We, we really um, keep the ball rolling the entire time. Um, We'll get reliefs. Uh, some folks will take a trip off maybe and then someone else will come in and an, an augmenter will come in and, and help out with the, with, the, with the crew. That's how we keep people fresh. Try to um, um, allow people to have as much time off as possible. Sometimes you can't do that and, and uh, things, things are always better when people are uh, rested. Um, so then after ground fish, we come in for a few days and then we set up for our shark shark longline and shark snapper survey and we focus on um, the, uh, the um, shark survey and it's, it's quite, quite the thing. Sometimes 
we'll catch these giant giants like this big big hammerhead or we'll catch very small um, very small uh, juvenile uh, sharks and, and various various species you mentioned that that cradle is 10 feet right that's so. uh, our 10 foot cradle and and that that was a real beast right there uh, um, and we'll get several of those um, I I think that the the biggest sharks I've seen have 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 come from the un unusual places but um, our survey for shark will carry us from from Pascagoula Mississippi around to the east coast and we'll start usually fishing around um, I don't know, Fort Pierce Florida and then we'll work our way up to the Outer Banks and last last time we did it we made it as far as we've ever been and we made it all the way to Hatteras and, and we caught some giants up there so what uh, so you mentioned that we showed the plankton nets and then you mentioned the trawling for ground fish how are the uh, sharks sampled um, what we use is called a long line um, method and with that we have a uh, the survey is set up for um, 100 hooks on a one mile fishing line and it is in the water for one hour and as soon as we set the gear the timer starts and we go and we'll do our CTD and then we'll steam to the other end and pick it up and retrieve it and that can take uh, can go quickly or it can take a while depending on if you catch anything or if there's any um, tangles or um, uh, anything get maybe uh, you, maybe you might catch a fish on every other hook or you might catch one so it, it goes rather rather quickly so what Sometimes. do you do <laughs> once you land the sharks or the um, fish? what happens here you'll you'll see there's a few of us standing there so we're, we're in this picture especially <coughs> we're um, we're bringing the shark up and we have on the Oregon we have two cranes and then we have an aft crane which uh, helps with the with the ground fish shrimping and this forward crane helps with plankton and the um, the uh, um, shark survey and um, the crane is holding the 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 cradle and so what what the the the, the guys are doing here is um, this is me and uh, we will um, manipulate the shark uh, we'll take the 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 line off of the um, so, off of the this, main line and, and kind of lead them up onto this uh -huh. and then we'll bring the cradle up to the deck edge and that's what's going on here we're setting it up so as soon as we get this cradle into position and get the shark righted and uh, comfortable and, and calm then the scientific crew comes in so we'll have probably four or five people all wearing their hard hats glasses gloves PPE and, and what have you flotation move right into there and in very short order we will we will achieve a, a length we'll get a tissue sample we'll get a, a maturity a sex um, overall length and we'll get a, a to the to the tail we'll, we'll look for any um, any differences about the shark anything maybe something special going on with that up um, and um, like in this picture it, it ate a smaller shark so there was actually two sharks on this so we'll also note that this hammerhead ate the other shark so that looks like it may have been a, a an Atlantic sharp nose or something like that so that was actually a, a, a dead damaged um, Atlantic sharp nose eaten by this and caught um, hammerhead and then it goes back in the water yep and that process is uh, about less than five minutes but typically about three minutes so we're, we're we've uh, gotten this down the Oregon 2 is has been doing this survey for over 20 years and um, we got this down so fast and we the fact that we do it for two months of the years we've we've um, uh, we're the longest uh, I, I can't really quote it that we're the only but we're, we're pretty much one of the the, the top survey of um, um, this distribution and this 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 area the southeast so that the, con continually doing this and, and spending this much time so the cradle does a couple of things one it reduces stress on the shark instead of like pulling the shark up by a hook like a a lot of fishermen would do say you know what fish that were submitted for the yes. out at deep sea yeah. fishing rodeo so it reduces the stress on the shark because most of these you're going to release alive right yep we're and, putting them right back and we yeah. don't 
our, our um, mortality rate is, is uh, very low. We, um, I can say that, that the majority of our, our sharks go back and swim off. And also, you know, it kind of puts it in a position for all the data that we collected. Yes. So the it's a great, a great presentation and, um, and it works very well for us. And, and if you have a, you know, if, if everybody had a 180 foot uh, ship with a crane with a big <laughs> cradle, we'd get a heck of a lot more, more data. I'm sure other, other organizations are doing this as well, but, but we're very proud of our, of our, our system and our survey. Do you tag them? Oh yeah, that's the other thing we do. We do several different kinds of tags. We have spot tags, we have sat tags, we have, uh, and we have our little um, um, spaghetti type tags that are very popular and then also a little clip that we'll put onto the smaller species. With um, and all that, we'll have a number and maybe a, a, some sort of a phone number or something like that you could actually call back. And we've actually caught some of our past fish before and last season, I think we did it two times. Recapture? So, oh, yeah, wow. a recapture. Yeah. Interesting. Um, so you mentioned that you sometimes catch other fish when you're doing the shark service. Oh yeah. What um, do you? Uh, <clears throat> what else do you catch, and what do you do with them? That's a great question. Um, sharks are not the um, the only um, star of the show. We have the the uh, red snapper, which is a very very interesting. Um, uh, topic to many folks, especially in the Gulf of Mexico, that's also our um, also our target is the um, the red snapper. And uh, what we'll do with those is we'll, we'll every red snapper that comes on board, we have to keep and we'll grab a nodalith, size, weight, sex, um, same same another, same deal. Uh, oh yeah. Picture of Chris with the shark <coughs> in the cradle. Uh, yep, that was a big tiger shark. Um, and uh, again, uh, that's just something else. And being able to do this, most, if you want to do this, you know, this is something that, that people can do, but it, 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 you gotta be, be you gotta wanna do this. <laughs> as a career. Uh, yeah, this is one of the movement characteristics that I learned as a, 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 as a commercial fisherman, as a young guy, really paid off because I could, I understood. But I did learn something and, 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 and about this is, Handling sharks with, with uh, bare arms is not a good thing. I've actually had a, a very a large wound just from simply doing this move, but reaching over and trying to position a large bull shark. And the shrug of that shark really mo removed a, a large patch of my because skin. Because they have such rough because skin. Because of the rough skin, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, rough seas. Yeah. So you mentioned the um, snapper. What else might you pull up on the long line? On the long line, we get all kinds of stuff. Well, we'll, we'll sometimes we'll catch uh, the cobia. We'll catch um, different types of snappers. We'll, we'll catch uh, mangrove snappers. We'll catch jacks. Uh, out in the deep water, we catch the uh, um, various groupers. We'll catch the uh, uh, tilefish and um, Really neat stuff. The queen snapper, the, um, the uh, uh, um, horse hog groupers. Um, the and list goes all on. All that is recorded, even though and they're not necessarily. Everything is everything is recorded, species. and um, yeah. Um, so you do two months of the two months of that of the long line yes. surveys, and then you mentioned that you do another fall ground fish survey, and then another fall ground fish, and survey, then that we do brings the, you back to November. And that puts us back into November, the end of the season, and um, by then everyone is ready for some time off, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, so now uh, a couple other things about NOAA, and and uh, this is interesting. It's not just the ships; they have the NOAA diving program. They also have the Hurricane Hunters, and they have the all the other labs around. And they there's so much other uh, stuff that they're interested in. Uh, would be. Um, um, Oil spills is a it, water quality. Um, the NOAA Corps is the uh, is part of our uh, our chain of uh, command on these ships. The NOAA Corps is um, one of the services. So you have the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, uh, Coast Guard, and then you have the Public Health Service, and then you have the NOAA Corps. And NOAA Corps falls in into that, and um, they're um, um, uh, a, a, somewhat uh, a military type of organization and um, they uh, 
run our uh, command of the ships and then the civilian mariners work alongside with them. Uh, you mentioned that in the time that the ship is in port, there are lots of different things going on that um, folks might be able to take some time off, but then they're not off from November to April. They're right. doing other things, ship maintenance, you mentioned training. So some of the training that they might do is what? You've got a couple of pictures well, in here. Um, one of the one of the interesting things that I was able to do um, was become part of the uh, NOAA NOAA dive um, uh, NOAA dive program, and um, this is a picture of me down on on one of our dives when we were in Tahiti, and that was just a, a really beautiful um, spot. Um, that that was an, a great opportunity to get the best dive training from the best divers in in the world. Um, and um, that's a really great thing. And that's open to anybody that wants to do it. If you find yourself working as a, as a civilian mariner, um, professional mariner, um, and you're, you're interested in that, that line, that's one of the things you can do. Um, when I was with uh, Military Sea Lift Command, I became a Navy rescue swimmer. And that was cool. Uh, I was um, able to do that for the Department of Defense on their supply ships. So I went to Navy Rescue Swimmer School and um, did that for several years. Um, that was quite, quite the achievement. And um, all kinds of stuff through the Department of the Navy and the Navy. Yeah. So just a couple of these other pictures that we didn't actually talk about, but this is one of the uh, This is um, some of our um, um, net that we use and uh, one of our, our uh, technicians from the harvesting unit over in Pascagoula. Um, sometimes we have to make some repairs and, and those guys help us out. So is this one of the trawls? Yeah, this is one of our trawl nets, yep. So we talked about the long line, then there's the trawl, and then we showed the plankton net. So those are the kinds of sampling equipment that yes. you're using to yes. pull, um, pull things out of the water. Mm -hmm. So, um, is there anything else that you'd kind of, sort of big picture that you'd like to leave um, folks with as... Big picture um, is, uh, when we started talking about this, I had this great sense of adventure and, and uh, just, I knew that there was something out there. I wasn't a good student. I needed, wanted to do something big and I, um, I was, I found, I stumbled up. I just stumbled up into this stuff and and um, I feel very, very um, um, honored to have been able to travel and spend so much time doing what I love. And, and um, my thought is that if, if, um, if I could ever uh, encourage or inspire any, any folks to uh, as, uh, have a look at something like this, it, it, it is, takes a lot of, you really got to want to do it. And um, it's a very fulfilling career. Calling. Calling. I would say yes, calling. Um, the the uh, salary is, is always, um, it's, it's good. It's, com it, it's somewhat comparable to the, um, the uh, um, maybe the energy field or, or the uh, transportation markets. Um, but they, the difference is, is this is an interesting route where the other types of merchant marine work are pretty, pretty straightforward and there's not a lot of extra stuff involved with it. If you want a really challenging, interesting route, this is, NOAA is definitely the way to go and um, it's just has been an honor to do that, yeah, for sure. Thanks for telling us about it and uh, yeah, I mean, you. you've had quite the uh, interesting career both before you joined NOAA and then since you know you've been working with NOAA you've done some really amazing things. And, well, thank you. Um, thank you very much. interesting to hear about them. Yeah um, it's it's all about the uh, sense of adventure and I, I would wrap up with saying that 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 was that's the key and being that 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 kid looking out the window and and um, just knowing that there was so much more out there. Yeah. Thank you, Chris.